afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Quiet in the uh, in the cheap seats there. You can't hear me. I'll try and get even. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, good afternoon, and welcome to uh, Jeremy and I's presentation on DevOps at Lightspeed: Lessons that we learned in building uh, Raygun.io. Um, today we want to sort of walk you through a story about how uh, just under a year ago we built a uh, online hosted service for tracking software exceptions from many different programming languages. And uh, this sort of represented certain challenges to us in terms of uh, scaling and performance, but also in sort of, we're generally a team of developers and now we needed some operation skills. And uh, yeah. First off, good day everyone, um, yeah, great to be here again. Yeah, I mean it was, it was an interesting um, little journey we took um, and, and um, you know, again, uh, our background at, at Mindscape is in building software frameworks and components for other developers and so um, the whole idea of stepping into, you know, the, 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 the big SaaS world with people like Zero, you know, it, it was a whole new challenge for us. and. Um, it's kind of interesting because you know, uh, you know, when you, when you, I often find when you're developing things, you know, you get very focused on what you're doing and, and the tools and and um, frameworks that you're kind of working with at that point in time. And this really opened our eyes up a lot to some of the um, some of the other things that are out there that a lot of these you know hip cool San Francisco companies are using to power their systems. And we thought you know uh, it would be great to sort of share that some of those learnings with you. Yeah, um, it meant that we sort of had to start adopting a little bit of a of a a DevOps sort of way of operating within our company, and that's sort of become a bit of a, a buzz term in, in recent years. <laughs> well, and, and what do you think of, of you know what is DevOps, JD? I mean, uh, it's a bit of a bit of a hype term, isn't it? It is, it is. But you know, the way I see it is that sort of that understanding of what's happening in operations, and, not, and as well as development, no longer taking that approach of sort of like, hey, I finished writing my code and I checked it in, and now it's someone else's problem to deploy it, and you know, it's in their black box now. I don't have to deal with any issues. Yeah, and, and certainly for us, as a, I mean, we're a small team, we're sort of seven people in the company. Um, you know, often you find yourself in these sort of small focused teams where you know you're, you're building something, and then, and then oh, what happens to it over the other side? And so we had to learn a lot about blending the roles that we took. You know, not just development, but also blending into operations. Um, as, as we kind of made the you know made the transition into yep. launching this product and then and then obviously having customers use it, yep. um, and, and fundamentally the product itself is kind of a DevOps product, isn't it? You know, it kind of yeah, helps people. it is. It's about blending that view of the problems that are happening in production, bringing them back to developers. And so we wanted today to sort of share some of those stories about what we've sort of found has worked for us in that sort of DevOps landscape. And because you know you're a technical audience, we also wanted to share some of the tools and things that we use to try and scale up and improve the performance of the service. Cool, man. Well, we've got lots to go with, so let's get started. Um, first thing, let's um, have a quick sort of context on on Raygun itself. Um, so for that, let's flip over here and just quickly describe kind of what, what it is that we built. Who here doesn't know what Raygun.io is? Right, so ah, everyone. Somebody <laughs> in marketing is getting fired. Getting fired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, yeah, so I mean, fundamentally, simple sort of problem space, right? I mean, I'm sure you've all kind of dealt with this. You build a, build a system, uh, you, you, you put it into production somewhere, and then, you know, try as you might, it has a bug. <laughs> and, you know, even, I've tried really hard on this myself over the years, writing perfect software. It just doesn't work. Um, so what do you do? Well, maybe we'll just, uh, you know, crack up a log file, write out a stack trace to that when we get it. Uh, maybe we'll send an email to ourselves. Sounds great until you find your system is spamming you with you know, 100,000 emails and you're like, ah, stuff this, yeah. let's put it into you know, exchange, uh, exchange rule, push this off to another folder, yeah. we don't care about this or, anymore. Or in my case, you know, we, I was keeping an eye on the Mindscape public site and generally about 95% of all the errors were just triggered by spam bots and, and junk like that. So I sort of desensitized myself to paying any attention to what I was emailing. And it was very easy to miss one that would kind of go, hey, your credit card processing system is offline. You just kind of like delete, delete, delete. This is all junk. So we wanted something better. Yep. So real quickly, you know, you, you plug plug something into your application, a bit of bit of code, and it fires all those errors at our service. You get a nice dashboard here. You can see the kind of errors over time. This is uh, a, a, the actual dashboard for one of our other products, um, Web Workbench, which is a, a little plugin for Visual Studio. And you can kind of see here, you know, we've got the errors that have come in from customers. I mean, this is kind of an interesting one because we've got it installed. It, um, you know, it's a Visual Studio extension, and there's over 100,000 people using it. 
and very few of these people actually tell us about anything that's going wrong with the product. So it's really useful to actually you know, find out for ourselves what's going wrong. Um, so you, can, you, know, you can see here, there's a, there's a list of all the errors that people have been seeing, you know, how many of a particular type, you can sort that, you, know, you can yep. select a little date range to, to, to sort of drill in on it further and, and focus in on what you're looking at. Um, and then you can drill it on, on an error itself and kind of see, you know, oh, yep. here's the stack trace. And as a developer, that's kind of the, the big problem, right? You know, you don't want to be dealing with people who have to take screenshots and try and describe things to you in non-technical terms. You just want to stack trace. <laughs> you want to focus in on the error and just start writing some code to solve it. Who here loves getting screenshots inside Word documents to explain a problem? <laughs> <laughs> You know. We also wanted to make this a bit extensible, so you can see here Jeremy has made it so that it reports the other add-ins that are within Visual Studio because that's a common point of, of problems. The other thing is, and why this is so useful to us, is that it's actually really, really hard to find um, the stack traces when something goes wrong in Visual Studio. Even things like the activity log, it quite often just says, you know, error, some sort of weird H result, and we kind of go, mm, don't know what the hell that is. But uh, so we, we've managed to close a lot of bugs using this this tool. Yeah, and you know, we, we, we've had the the system live for sort of six six or so months now, and you know, lots of people finding it really productive. So. With that, let's let's kind of go back to our story. And um, where do we start, man? What, what what happened at the beginning? So one of the things that we wanted to sort of uh, focus on was, you know, if we're building a DevOps product and we need to sort of upskill in the world of operations and actually uh, instill the right sort of mentality in our own team to make sure that this is a success. And so one of the the sort of um, first things we wanted to do was first off make everybody aware that they're all responsible. So I think that's what the next slide says, but um, yeah, everyone on the team is responsible. So that means that we have all of our sort of, all of the error data is available, all of the server metrics are available, all, you know, everybody can see every part of the system across the whole company, which to be fair, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to implement that sort of responsibility within a small company. It is a challenge in a larger company, but we've found that it's been really, really useful. I mean, we can literally, you know, sometimes you miss something and, you know, Hillary and marketing will kind of, you know, be waving your hand saying, hey, there's a big, there's a big red uh, error message up on that, on that screen in the back there, you know, what's going on? Um, so we've found that, that sharing that responsibility has been really empowering to, to the team as well. Yeah, I mean one of, one of the com common um, problems we kind of face as developers over the years is we kind of get into, into team structures where, you know, everyone's kind of working on very focused problems and you, so you kind of get compartmentalised into, into, okay, I'm just working on this little black box and I deal with this guy's black box and this guy's black box and together we combine to, you know, create some sort of super machine. But, you know, hey, if there's a problem in that guy's black box, well, hey, JD, that's your problem, man, I don't, don't care about it. But with the kind of DevOps way of thinking, you know, because you're kind of having to, to juggle both the development of the system and then obviously how it's living and breathing when it's actually running, is you kind of do need everyone to feel like, oh right, this thing's mine, yep. I own it, I need yep. to take responsibility for it. Yep. Um, and then to support that, we obviously need, because you know, I, as a developer, I'm used to Visual Studio, how on earth am I going to get all that sort of information? We have to make the, the, the right sort of tools and also encourage a process yep. to, to sort of support that behaviour. Yeah, so, so the first part here we wanted to get out the fluffy stuff about you know, your team dynamics and everybody being on board and responsible, but how do you actually facilitate that? And that's where tooling comes in and is, is really helpful. Yeah, so I mean the, the tools that we um, sort of started using with, when building Raygun, obviously we've got Visual Studio, you need to write lots of code in .NET. Um, and then we've got our, our source control system. Um, we, we use Git uh, with GitHub uh, for that. Um, and then you know you've got your common stuff. I mean automated build server. I mean presumably everyone's kind of automating builds using build scripts, uh, TFS build that sort of thing mm -hmm. these days. Um, we we use Team City for our, our automated builds. But the most um, interesting thing that we kind of took on board um, with this is something to help our help our communication. Um, and this is something we've seen other companies that have been reasonably successful take on board as well, um, like yep. Xero, uh, which is, you know, you've got to uh, use an IM tool. Um, and in our case, we used HipChat um, to actually just have everyone in one place talking together. It doesn't matter if you're working remotely, working mm. in the office, you've, you know, you've got all your, 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 your comms there so that it's captured and anyone yep. can come back at any point in time and scroll through it. And it scales really nicely because one of the things is, for example, if you're in a larger company, you can set up rooms. So maybe there's a room for a product uh, that you're working on. In our case, most of the team is on the Raygun room. And then we've got other things around marketing. So there's focus as well as one-on-one -on -one messaging. 
but HipChat itself is really extensible. So we've made great use of that by having, for example, the, the Raygun chat room in the company where everybody's on there. You can see every commit that goes into Git, every issue that gets raised. We have uh, Raygun actually integrates into, into uh, HipChat as well to report any errors that we have in production. Um, everything is going through there. So it's kind of like the heartbeat of the entire product and to a you know, lesser extent the whole company really uh, through that tool. Yeah, and absolutely, you, you kind of mentioned we've got other stuff going in there. So, I mean, one of the things that was really important to us, I mean, I, like, I know, um, you know, like people like Intergen use Link, um, people like Zero use Yammer, um, you know, they're all good tools, it doesn't really matter what you use, but what we want, what we're interested in is being able to integrate other things into that, into that space. So, you know, because we're, we're a group of developers and we don't know too much about operations when we started is we wanted to make sure all the operational data could be fed into us as well. So alerting, you know, any alerts come into the central place, uh, you know, as say commits come in here. So everyone's got a really good awareness about what's going on. Um, and then we, you know, around the, around the edge of that, um, we've got other things like our monitoring. And of course, we also use Raygun. Raygun itself. <laughs> um, now the other tool that was, um, you know, really, really cool um, that, we, that we picked up on that we hadn't used before um, was an automated deployment tool. Is and anybody here doing automated deployments at the moment? Yeah, a few. So a few of you, yep. Really, really, I, I was <laughs> very surprised at how much of a product pro productivity boost we actually got by using this. Yep. And the, the reason for that, man, is because typ typically what would happen in the past is, you know, we needed a release done, what would happen, you'd call me and to go, hey, can you put this on the server? And, you know, I'd package it up and, and put it on the server. But obviously that just eats time. Yeah, and or we'd end up with one person owning things. So I would own the Mindscape public site, Jeremy would own some other system, and then everybody in the company who works on things has to go and talk to that person to get a deployment done. And that, yeah. that was just a real roadblock. So we found a really um, great uh, automated deployment tool that we'd highly recommend to, for, for .NET developers called Octopus Deploy. It's specifically built for .NET um, development. Yep. Um, written by a guy in Australia called Paul Stogel, yep. um, and it's really, really simple to use. Um, what I thought we could do, man, um, is just pop out of this, pop out of here. Is um, actually do um, do some work. Yep. Um, let's do let, 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 let's solve some solve some problems, um, and actually use this automated deployment tool while we're at it. Yep. Um, so you know, I mentioned we use we use GitHub. So for for issue tracking and for source control. Yep. Um, so here's a, here's a nice sim little simple issue we could deal with right now. That's right. I've always been a big fan of ASCII art when you view source on any web page. And uh, in, in the Raygun app, if you view the source, there's an ASCII art Raygun because that makes sense. Um, what we don't have though is in... I should probably put that on the pricing page as a feature. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, but, but I don't think we have it in the public side at the moment, which is uh, you know, really going to hurt us in, in uh, attracting that uh, 18 to 27-year-old hipster demographic. So um, This is not going to get us funded. No, no. <laughs> so Jeremy's okay. got to fix this because ASCII art to be on my, my scale. Cool. So um, real easy to obviously code this up. So um, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm using GitHub here, and I'm just going to... Um, one of the things that, we, um, that worked really nicely for us when building this is... Um, you know, previously we used um, uh, Subversion, and you know, um, you know, we weren't very good at branching. And and when we started on Raygun, we decided to switch to using Git. And um, the, one of the big, you know, the big selling points of this um, is, is a different uh, way of managing source control is that branching is really easy. And you know, it took me a while to buy into it, but it's really been amazingly productive for us because what we do is any kind of change that we make, um, we create what's called a topic branch. And that's just, you know, the feature that you're working on, you just check all the code into that branch. You branch it off master at that point, um, and you just go ahead and do your work, and then you merge it back in later. So and in this case, you've created a topic branch for adding ASCII art to the public website. Absolutely. So we can see um, that. And, and what, what this kind of allows us to do is work on lots and lots of different features all at once, because they're all on their own branches, and then all we have to do is just merge them back together later on. Yeah. Um, and, you know... It, it, Sounds odd, but it works surprisingly well, and, and that's one of the things that's helped us be, you know, a little bit more productive because we can get everyone working on different things concurrently. Yep. So okay, we've got that. We've got our little branch. Um, here's the code I'm going to check in, man. And you know, one of the things we also that's really nice with these sort of um, tools these days is it's really easy to do code reviews just by diffs. So you know, have a look at what's what's diffed. Oh yeah, I've just added the uh, you know the HTML comment in with the ASCII art. Yep. 
Let's go ahead and... That's uh, about the uh, one of the few stages where you kind of, in our organisation, you need another person, is that the general thing is, Jeremy will write some code, or anybody writes some code, and you get somebody else to review the, the pull request, and they choose to merge it in. So yep. that, you know, you just get that second set of eyes. Am I, am I good to merge? Yeah, that looked like a pretty cool ray gun. Cool. Okay, let's go. Okay, so now what's happened is our automated build server is kind of monitoring that, as it does, and goes ahead and, and, and builds um, builds that branch. Uh, it's going to build master now that it's merged in. Um, and then we can go over to Octopus, um, which is the automated deployment tool. And um, Octopus uh, kind of has a, you know, it's a simple enough tool. We've got the notion of environments. So, you know, where are, we, where are we deploying this to? You know, we've got obviously develop machines, but then we've got an internal test environment, we've got a beta environment, and we've got our production environment. And so we can create a release and then choose to deploy that release Oh yeah, to office, beta, or production. So let, let's go and you know go through a nice safe process here of yep. deploying this to office. Yep. And that's what we, we've found a really good um, for us anyway, a sort of um, the environments to have set up. We used to have more of them sitting there, but we found having something in the office is really useful because we can pretty much deploy anything onto that whenever we want, and then we can ask anybody in the company, you know, hey, go and give this a kick around because for all the unit tests and all of that stuff. At the end of the day, there's still, you know, oh, the merge went wrong, or, you know, oh, that didn't work in Firefox quite right, and those sorts of things, and getting people to eyeball those things is good. Okay, so the change I'm looking for is, oh, yep, there it is. Yep. The so that's, is there. that's on Office. So I have to admit that when uh, Jeremy's now going to promote this up to the public website, which when he said to me, you know what, man, I really want to uh, do a deployment live on stage as part of my demo. You know, I've heard of demos going bad at TechEd, thankfully I've... I've not been harmed by them myself, but I thought, yeah, this, this sounds like a good idea, really, just screw up the whole public website. Um, but uh, that, that, That's the faith I have in our tooling, man. Yep. That's the faith I have in this So to kind of wind back a little bit about how Octopus kind of works, um, is it, it's simple enough, but you have to kind of um, make a few things available to you. Um, fundamentally, um, if we have a look at the dashboard here, we've got our, our, our different projects that we're working with, our environments, and then you can see in this sort of matrix here, there's um, version numbers that were released to each environment, and that one's kind of in progress down there. Um, so the way this kind of works is it relies on NuGet packages, and um, you know that, that's familiar enough to us these days as developers in, in .NET land. The way we build these NuGet packages is we just add a little uh, call into our, uh, our build scripts, our MS build scripts, um, to package up the published version of what we want to release Onto our, onto our environments uh, into a little NuGet package. So th uh, thinking about this in terms of our website, what is it that we publish? Well, we publish the website. So if I, I'm in Visual Studio, I go publish this website. What do I get out the other side? A higher, you know, directory full of files, my, my ASPX pages or my CSHTML pages, CSS, JavaScript, and the other assets that I've chosen, chosen to bundle in there. Okay. Octopus then provides a little command line tool called Octopack. You add that in, you just say Octopack the directory, and it'll package that up. And then you get a nice little NuGet package out the other side. Octopus then knows, OK, I can see all these NuGet packages, you know, either published through a NuGet server, which handily for us, Team City provides, or just it might just be a, a directory that you've got on your build server that, that the Octopus server can see, shared directory. It can then say, oh, right, I can see all these packages. So when I go to create a new release, What's, what's the latest version number that I see? And then we, we go through the process of deploying it to this environment, testing it, deploying it to another environment. More than just deploying files, it can also um, execute other commands on the server. So it has hooks along the way to say, all right, uh, as I'm about to copy the files in, do you want to do anything? And so you can provide PowerShell scripts that are part of that NuGet package that just execute uh, you know, as if you're logged into the box doing things. And you might want to you know, stop a service, then deploy the files, then you know, start the service up again. So that, that gives you those sort of controls. Um, again, you know, the, how this has been really useful for us is you know, if you look at um, Team City, which is what we use for our, for our builds, we build a, a, a different version of, uh, of that package for every branch is every time a commit is made, we build a new package, and that way at any point in time we can take that package, put it onto any of the environments, you know, do some testing, yep, yep this is good to go, let's merge that, then we can push from master yep. um, into production. And we've, we've just generally found that these tools have helped us work really, really efficiently. You know, we, we, 
We hear companies and that talking about how you know they do quarterly releases or monthly releases, and you know ever since we started Mindscape, we've always released nightly builds of all of our developer products. And what's been great about having a hosted service is that we can sometimes do 10 or 20 deployments a day of small improvements, and it just helps us you know run faster than the competition. Um, and you know, that, that's been working really well for us and it's also just helped the team feel like they're achieving things. You know, nobody likes that whole, man, I, I felt really busy this week running code but nothing's kind of gone anywhere. Because it's so easy to do these deployments, you can do bite-sized bits really quick. Yeah, I mean, one of the things the team, you know, it's been really nice um, as a team dynamic is just getting that feeling of velocity yep. and nothing gives you that more than just releasing often, you know, shipping, working software often. Yep. Um, let's just check that that worked up, sweet. Good, man. Sales will soar. <laughs> but, uh, cool. Yeah. yeah to, to be fair, it's, it's been it's been an interesting thing internally with this now because if, if we don't ship code for like a day or two, it feels like something's wrong. Um, yeah. Which is is a good thing. Yeah. So the the other interesting um, thing about this is um, you know talking back about that whole team responsibility. Uh, everyone is responsible. Yeah. Is we've now even got the ability for our little designer Kyle, who yeah. you know when he joined us, he didn't know. What a server was. He just <laughs> yeah. thought the internet was, you know, some magical box in yeah, the that's cloud. Yeah, that's where Wow lives, right? So, <laughs> that's um, right. But yeah. even he now can, you know, he can make his, you know, oh, I see a problem in IE9, you know, with, and I can fix the CSS for it. Push that to Office, test it myself, get someone to check it for me. You know, I make the make the pull request. Someone code reviews it for me, so it's all safe. Then we push it to production, and he can yeah. do almost all of that himself. Yeah. So that is really empowering. Uh, for him and saves us a lot of time to have to you know do all of that for him so yep. you know highly highly it, recommended it, it's also one of those cases of you know if you can automate a repeatable process there's a, you know, a lower risk of screwing something up because oh this was just a quick patch so i didn't back up the files and then oh crap the can't roll back broken, and, yeah. <laughs> which is a, a, a useful note as well with uh, octopus deploy there is that it's one click to, to roll out and it's one click to roll back as well mm. so if something goes wrong yeah however of course not everything we'd uh, trust to an automated deployment system, of course. No. Um, certain things like for, for us, you know, we've, we've got kind of, uh, you know, terabyte sized databases and, you know, making schema changes to those can take a while. So we wouldn't really necessarily want to have that done as, a, as, as part of a build. Also certain uh, actions that you might take against a database are not easily reversible. Um, so we kind of, whenever we have to touch a database, we sort of do that very carefully and, 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 and manually. So. Yep. Cool. The other one was that we don't deploy, we don't currently provision new servers either uh, using this process, but you can do that with certain tools like... Yeah, it's uh, Chef, Puppet, um, and what's the other one? Docker. Docker, yeah, that's yeah. the new call apparently. Josh Robb's been banging on about how it's like Git for servers, but uh, so far we don't need to keep expanding out the servers too rapidly, so we haven't bothered to, to set that to be automated. Yeah, so I mean th those sort of you know couple of little tweaks, you know, good communication, a good process, and having that automated deploy added in over the top of the automated build, really gave us great velocity in building the product. And so you know we sort of started building the product in about October. We had the first um, you know, release of the system out into customers' hands sort of uh, late February, yeah, so beta, yep. beta customers all ready to go. Great. You know, typically, as developers, this is where our sort of stage in the process largely ends, other than you know, dealing with bugs, but whoever writes code yeah. bugs. You know. yep. So this was where a lot of the learning started for us, is you know, in the move to production, what's involved and, and, and what happened. So, you know, so you, you know, we kind of released it up there. We we mailed out to you know a couple thousand people. You know, come on, come on, you know, come get and give in. it a test. Come and give it a, give it a test. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, a few days in, everything was looking great. You know, logged onto the boxes. You know, zero zero percent load and all that sort of thing. Then all of a sudden, whoa, yeah. <laughs> oh, hundred percent CPU. That's, yeah. that's not good, man. What's what's going on? Yeah, we, we, we kind of put it out there. We'd, we'd done some you know, math ourselves on what we needed for performance. We took how many errors we generated. We thought, OK. How, how, many, how many errors you know, would you kind of gauge? A, well, like, a let's take the Mindscape take. website. You know, yeah. There's thousands of visitors to that every day. And yet it maybe generates, say, 100 exceptions, of which, say, 95 are typically just spam bots and, and junk like that. Yeah. So you kind of go, all right, well. Let's assume a large. Let, let's take a number and times it by ten. Yeah, you yeah. know, because that's a common thing. You know, you don't want to prematurely optimize. You just want enough, uh, enough sort of capability in there. So that that holds true until like customer number three is a top ten Facebook game, right? These guys were generating millions of errors per hour, 
stomping our service with how much data was it? Uh, four, four, four megabytes per second. Yeah, megabytes a second <laughs> of JSON error data just blowing in there, and you kind of go, son of a bitch. It's like, you know, you know really? Number three? Um, <laughs> cool, all right. So, uh, what do you do in this scenario, Jeremy? Well, you know, as a, as a true developer, I'd just say get more servers, man. Yeah. Just, just, just scale it out. And that, that's. That's what uh, you know. Everybody keeps saying, "Oh, developers are really expensive. Just get more servers." And that's what Jeff wants you to believe. But that's troll face, Jeff. He wants you to get more servers. All right. And so uh, we kind of went, "Ah, oh, okay. We got to start start resolving some of this." Now, to be to be clear, in certain scenarios, yes, more servers is cheaper than developers. But the reality is, nobody seems to talk about the fact that that only is true at the end of the diminishing returns curve. And at the start. Okay, two days of triple performance yeah. or whatever, you know. Now, like you guys, I was sold on the vision of the cloud, you know. <laughs> and the vision to me was, you've got this infinite computing power, infinite memory at your disposal. Yeah. You know Any what else time you, you want. You can scale up, you can scale it down, it'll be, you know, perfect for exactly what you want to use it for. But no one really talks about the cost of this thing, <laughs> you know. That's right. And it all sounds really cheap when you're talking about single CPU core here, a little bit of memory there. That's cool. But, uh, yeah, it, it gets a bit, bit out of control. And so uh, what we found was that, um, and in particular, I draw attention to a particular feature that we had. So early on, we didn't ship with search, all right? And of course, that was one of the first things that people wanted. They said, hey, look, if I'm generating you know, three million errors an hour, I want to go and find that particular error that this person reported. That needle in that haystack that yeah. I know is there. Who would have thought? Um, so we, we uh, built a um, Elasticsearch cluster. And I'll give you a, a demo of that shortly. But what we found was that Elasticsearch needs a lot of memory, and in particular, uh, it gets it's pretty it's a pretty heavy abuser of I/O. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had we hosted everything at this point for Raygun on Jeff's cloud, AWS. Nothing against Azure or anything. We've just been using AWS for donkey's years, and it was you know the devil we know. And so we set up this cluster for doing search, and we we're indexing it. And this thing was just, you know, we needed three servers minimum, which is the recommended amount. But we had to keep scaling these servers up and up and up. And then we were starting to go, oh, we need more servers. And I, I kind of did the math. And this was admittedly early days. But we were spending something like 16 US dollars per customer just to provide search. All right? And that's, uh, that's quite a big expense. We'd also identified at this point that uh, our database, our relational database, was the biggest point of contention in our system. And we had a fairly hefty. Uh, box for that. In fact, within a few weeks, it was scary to realize that we had, you know, approaching on a terabyte worth of data. Yeah, when you realize that you can't <laughs> actually bring the data back to New Zealand for a local copy because of our shitty internet, that's uh, not so good. Um, anyway, so we didn't really want to, you know, conventional wisdom would have said, oh, just turn on full text indexing or something on your, on your database. This wasn't going to fly. So we went and looked at uh, Elasticsearch. So we started going, well, how do we lower the costs of this? Because it just seemed absurd to me that this was so expensive. And so we started having a look around. And we stumbled on a uh, host called DigitalOcean. Who here knows about DigitalOcean? A couple, yeah, good. Okay, a couple. So, I mean, that's another thing. I mean, again, I must have been a cloud noob or something because, you know, I just thought, you know, AWS, Azure, more, you know, Bob, Bob's cloud hosting number three, they all must be equal, right? Yeah. But it turns out that they're not. You know, you've got, you know, you, you buy one of these, you know, cloud units, a VPS or, 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 or you know, a worker role on, on Azure, and, you know, it's got a, a certain amount of CPU capacity, a certain amount of memory, and it's got I.O., you know, yep. through a disk. And, 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 you know, I was kind of, I guess, shocked to find that, you know, that can vary quite a lot, and in particular, um, what we're looking for here, you know, the I.O., on some of these things is just absolutely abysmal. You know, you just wouldn't even think about how bad it is because you think, oh, we went from re these rusting spinning disks to SSD disks, but in the cloud, they're, they're, they're well back there in, you know, like 19, 1985 mm. spinning yeah. disk land. Uh, you know, the performance is, is really horrible. Yep. Um, but as it turns out, this, all, this is why there's been a huge boom in the sort of boutique cloud hosting space for actually making more direct access to hardware available where the bigger cloud providers aren't really doing that just yet. Yep. Um, and so, you know, like DigitalOcean, for example, their big selling point is we give you direct access to SSD disks, which, you know, for yeah. I.O. <laughs> so we went from about win. 40 megabytes per second reads to 550 megabytes per second reads. And what we also found when looking at these guys was that they had twice as much memory, double the CPU capability, SSD disks, half the price. 
So it's like, oh, holy crap, we can, you know, we can, we can load a lot more into this and get a lot more performance and, uh, you know, save a lot of money. And one of the things we were a little bit worried about, though, was this whole, like, you know, okay, well, our stuff's currently all sitting, you know, with, a with Amazon and a little bit spread out over different zones. But, you know, what about putting part of your system in a whole another cloud provider's environment? You know, what's our latency and problems going to be there? Well, again, this is probably something that New Zealanders overthink because we're so used to everything being slow. Over there, we found that you know these can be in other data centers that might be 100 miles away, but it was Latent all, it latency was all, is pretty much equivalent. Yeah, it was basically <laughs> the same as going to a rack down the down the hallway. Um, so that worked out really well for us. And DigitalOcean, as an aside, they, their pricing starts about five bucks a month for a, for a host. It's pretty anemic. We obviously got bigger ones, but they were quite good for getting access to these SSD disks. And that. They were a startup. They've, they've got a whole lot of money raised. They've got about 250,000 web-facing hosts now, so they're, they're growing like a weed because SSDs are awesome. So you mentioned um, search, man, and, yep. and that's something again. I mean, a common developer problem that we face. That um, you know, was, when, we, when we realize, oh no, we're going to have to put search into Raygun. Uh, for, for me, like I've you know put search into a few systems over the years, and it's always been one of those really, really annoying problems because you know search. It's just hard, and then worse than hard, it is the fact that the end user has a really, really high bar in terms of what they expect, because they go log into their search engine every morning of every day and type yeah. in a query, and instantaneously they get a result, and they're like, "You need to make your search like that, and as flexible as that, you know. Otherwise, I'm going to be very angry with you." Yeah. And you know, as I said, you know, full text search that was you know one way we'd solve the problem in the past. Really slow, really hard to get working. You could just never get it working. We too. didn't want to bog down the database yeah. any further, and so and I also, yeah, you know, I've got a background in having done a bunch of work with uh, Lucene, uh, which is a really really nice library for doing search, um, building your own custom search stuff. But that's kind of like one library, you know. Mm. How do we make that scale? Yeah. So really conveniently, in the last few years, there's been an open source um, little product or effort put out there called Elasticsearch. Yep. And this kind of solves that problem really simply for you by providing a, you know, a scalable platform over the top of Lucene. So yep. you get all of the, um, I guess, the maturity and the power and the performance of Lucene. But then they've kind of wrapped over all of the, you know, you can scale it out to 20 yeah. nodes. You can load in 20 petabytes of data, and it still performs. Yeah. So you can search like a billion dollar company. That's right. So you've got the, the core Lucene stuff, and these guys add the operational goodness over the top, as well as a few other bits that I'll give you a quick demo of. So Jeremy will show you an example, um, which, which is common. And it's a feature you know, that people really like uh, in, in Raygun. And we want to make it even better so that for example, you might want to ignore any errors that have occurred in the particular old version because you've shipped a new version you know, and you don't care about the old stuff. But let's say Jeremy wants to find everything in a particular version of Web Workbench that went wrong. Yep, so, so something like that. So he's doing a query there with version, colon, and a particular value, right? And hopefully the tech head internet will hold up. But it's uh, all been connecting. Oh, uh, yep. What that will do is it will find every error instance which actually matches that version. Okay, and that's one of the nice things that uh, that Elasticsearch provides you is that uh, you can effectively pull, you know, match against anything that's provided to it, if it ever gets there. But anyway, so what I, what I might just do then is cut to the local copy of Elasticsearch for sure the demo. Sure. So you've got your Postman thing there. Yep. So we've got a um, a cool little uh, tool that that uh, I only recently found out about, and Jeremy's been using for a little while. is called uh, Postman. Has anybody Heard about this? Is this tool <coughs> basically Ample. just a, a little plugin uh, yeah. into into Chrome and that? So yep, and it's a really nice little REST client. It allows you to basically compose, um, you know, web requests and set them up. And so that's the facade that effectively uh, Elasticsearch provides to you is a REST API endpoint. There we go, man. It's fine. Oh, finally, yeah. finally, finally right got there. there. Cool. So you can see there that that's matching anything from that version. The reason we do instances is because you may be looking, for example, I want to find all errors that affected you know, Jeremy B at Mindscape. That do, returning a group doesn't make sense there because there could be a million of those errors and you don't want to go hunting for that particular instance. So that's, that's the way we've been working at the moment. Also, just as one, one minor note, as if we uh, click through to one of these, uh, the way that uh, Raygun's been built is that 
we do show you the raw data here. So the data that goes up to our service is just a JSON blob to begin with. Now that's important for us and made our life particularly easy because, again, that's what Elasticsearch speaks. So where did you hide the uh, Postman one? There. Cool. So what we've got over here is this here. I, we've just run up Elasticsearch on this, this machine. Elasticsearch works on Windows and on, on Linux. And if we just hit that endpoint, the default port is uh, 9200, you'll see that we just get a status from the, from the search cluster effectively telling us what's going on. Nothing, nothing particularly interesting. What we want to do is index some data. So what I've got here is I've got a raw blob of JSON. You can see here that uh, this here is, uh, is effectively the, the index, and this is the type. So I'm going to index an error, and I'm going to give it a primary uh, ID effectively 1. And I'm going to make it a post because it's a nice restful interface. And if I run this, you can see it comes down here. And it gives us a little bit of metadata about that. You can see it's version 3 because I practiced this a whole two times before getting on stage. If we come over here, this time I'm going to be running a, a GET request just going for error 1. If I call that, you'll see that we get this nice JSON blob back. And what's interesting here is there's that little bit of metadata about what's come back. Plus, they store the entire source by default, so I can pick that apart if I want to. Where this gets more interesting than uh, just poking a value in and pulling it out. One, one question for you, man. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's happening with Lucene behind this? Good question. So the way that Lucene works is it creates documents, and documents have collections of fields. Those fields have values. And so what's happening is, is that Elasticsearch is taking in the JSON and sort of shredding this JSON blob for us automatically. So it's doing things like making a field called app name and putting this value in there and making a field called version and putting that in there. And like, you know, to a degree, Lucene can be thought of as a document database almost. Um, you know, there's no schema that's set. It's what uh, tools like RavenDB are built on top of because they're quite flexible uh, like that. And that's how we can start doing those queries where we do something like, um, it's a bit hard to see there, but I'll just run it along to the end. If we go Raygun and we're looking at all of the errors here, I've still only got the one inserted. But if I, if I call the underscore search and I put the q equals version colon 1.1.star, that will match anything 1.1. Obviously, wildcard. So if I run that, and you can see here that we get paging information and just you know how many, what's the total number of things that we've got in there and all of that. And we can we can read that out easily. And if we've set a page size, we can do that. One of the things that's quite powerful, though, is, and I, I don't have a demonstration here because we could be here for all, you know, all day talking about Elasticsearch, but this, this querying is quite powerful. So I could just put in any old wildcard thing that would match anything in the document. I could match a given field. I can do Boolean operations to say this and this or this, not this. Um, I can do things like it will do rankings, but I might say, for example, that the app name uh, should be boosted in terms of uh, what's important to the, the search engine, things like that. I can do some really cool stuff. So would you normally use it with this REST interface, or, would, or how do I use it in my .NET app? So there's a fantastic library uh, for .NET developers called Nest, and that, uh, that gives you a nice you know, first class uh, C Sharp, VB if you use that, API. Um, to, to call against uh, Elasticsearch. But what is really nice, though, is that obviously all, a lot of other tools can work with Elastic mm. very easily. You can sort of sit there and debug stuff really fast. It's a very nice uh, product. Yeah, I mean, r ridiculous in a way uh, how, how simple it is to use. I mean, literally, you know, you go from the point of firing up a server, firing JSON at it, and already you can start searching across yeah. that, and, and that kind of scales, you know. Yeah. Uh, we've got a you know a few hundred terabytes in there currently, and you know it still performs just as it did when we only had sort of uh, you know a couple hundred, couple hundred meg in there. So uh, yeah. it, it, it's pretty it's, fantastic. It, it is fantastic. And Elasticsearch lets us just say, and here's the other nodes, and it will make sure that it's got replications and all of that. So if one of those nodes goes offline, your service is still available and all that cool good stuff. It yeah. was actually quite a challenge really putting together the demo here because we we're joking. It's like well, you just throw something at it and then you just fetch it back out and you can query it. Like does does what it says on the tin, the best sort of software there is. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, a couple other things just to take note of with it. I mean, the, um, 
you do want redundancy with it, um, and it does use a lot of RAM and it does use a bit of disk. So if you're thinking of putting it into an application um, mm -hmm. for search, um, make sure you've got a few a few machines, you know, yep. or VMs um, or you know virtual yep. uh, cloud hosts available um, to host this thing. We, I mean, for Raygun, you know, we're sort of dealing with a few hundred terabytes of data. Um, obviously, we've got disk to back that. Um, we needed that fast I/O, which is why we went with um, you know the cloud provider DigitalOcean, which which provided those SSD disks. So that was important. We also got um, 48 gigs of RAM um, across the cluster for that. So you know, not too bad on the RAM side. Definitely on the disk side. So just keep that in mind when you when you're building this thing. That your mileage will vary depending on how much you want to store in it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Back to the slides. Cool. So the, the next challenge we kind of faced, obviously, you know, we've, we've got this thing into production. We started dealing with some of the scale challenges um, with, you know, implemented search, is uh, monitoring. And uh, you know, this is certainly this is start get, is getting very far away from the, the developer land that we were kind of comfortable with. Um, so we kind of used uh, took two approaches for monitoring that have kind of worked reasonably well while being reasonably lightweight and understandable to to developers like ourselves. Um, so the first of which, oh. Yes. <laughs> right, we use Raygun. We don't need to go into that anymore. But we, uh, we wanted to sort of keep an eye on, on how the various servers were, were sort of performing. And uh, what, we, what we started off with, and we still use now, is a product called Munin. And it's uh, dog ugly, to be honest. Um, but what we've got here is a, is a snapshot of a bunch of the servers that we have in operation. And uh, you can see there that there's a, a list of different um, sort of things being monitored on the end of each server. So you can see there ASP.NET, ASP.NET cache, disk. Disk on the first one is yellow because it's kind of giving us a warning that we're starting to run a bit low on disk on that box. Um, and what's, what we've found really useful for this is actually just sort of you know, eyeballing how servers are operating and sort of you know, seeing trends. And you know, humans are brilliant at, at sort of identifying patterns. And so I didn't want to bore you by going through everything that's in there because this thing can give you a lot of information, right down to like how many interrupt requests are running against the CPU over weeks and months and all of that stuff. But here was an example leading up to uh, Jeremy and I coming away for TechEd. So we repurposed a box that was running Elasticsearch, which is why there's this huge blob of memory in use there. And we set up a cache on there. And we sort of were running that for a few days and it was like, hmm, anybody notice a pattern here? You know, this thing's just going up and up, and it seems to be happening at so the time each day. One in the morning. Yeah. So I was looking at that, and I thought, hmm, seems about one o'clock every day. Memory's going up. What's going on? Mm. What happens at one o'clock every day, JD? Well, I'm asleep. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, we actually send some emails. <laughs> um, you know, as part of our notifications, um, we send out a notification every time a new error occurs, but we also send up a, a daily roll-up. Yep. And that so, happens at one in the morning. So some people, for example, and again, this is part of this whole uh, involving your whole team, one of the design things of Raygun was that we send notifications as errors occur, but some people don't need every error. They might be the dev manager or project manager, and they just want to get a report each day saying, here's the problems. Yep. Right? So I, you know, using my very rough brain, I would think maybe the problem is there. So start debugging that. Go and take a look. You know, we hit, we it would kind of make sense. We cache that sort of stuff um, if there's a problem, so that we can go ahead, go ahead and have a look at it later. But honestly, you know, we're talking about what, like three, three and a half gig of RAM. How many emails are failing there? That might be a really big problem. So go on and have a look at that. And uh, what do I see? 18 emails have failed. 18 emails, three gigs of RAM. Hmm. Yes. Turns out there was actually 18, 18 emails taking three gigs of RAM because uh, again we had a, another great customer come on board that um, was was pumping like a, a few hundred thousand. Some people really shitty code is what we've learnt from this. <laughs> out of interest, that was a Java application. <laughs> yeah. So you know it's interesting things like that. I mean, again, you know, neither me or JD are really you know traditionally hardware guys, and and these sort of monitors would typically make very little sense for us other than and you know. We're debugging a particular problem, and we know that we need to monitor the CPU. But just having these things kind of available the whole time is, mm. allows you to kind of spot trends. And you know, I can't even describe the amount of times this guy kind of pings me with a text going, "Hey, I noticed this on the monitors. You know, on the on the monitoring. What yeah. do you think's up?" But it, it's just funny. Humans see patterns, and this just gives you a nice kind of broad set of statistics to kind of see those things yep. occur occurring. Like I say, it's relatively quick to set up. Works on Linux and Windows, and and gives you a nice central view. Yeah. 
So the other thing that um, we put in, um, and again, you know, one of the challenges we kind of are increasingly facing um, as developers building more complicated systems is there's a lot of moving parts, right? You know, um, for, for Raygun, you know, we've got these, we've got an API surface which is, you know, across a, a large number of boxes. We've got worker processes behind that. We've got uh, the websites. We've got uh, little t little tools. We've got Elasticsearch. Uh, we've got the database. You know, the, there's kind of a lot of things going on, yeah. and you know the the, the um, sort of server monitoring and you know kind of perfmon type stats give you one point of view of things. You know, they kind of tell you whether the machines are looking okay. But the other side of it is obviously is the application itself okay. So and we kind of end up where we're tracking, looking for problems at several stages, right? You kind of, you're doing dev, you write some unit tests that, you know, you, you test some assumptions. We put it in there and the server might be like bleeding memory so we can fix that. But the servers could all be fine and all the unit tests could be passing, but there could still be something in there that's leaked out, right? Yeah. So, you know, with, with these sort of complicated flows, like for example, for a message that comes into the system, it goes through our API, gets put on a queue, gets pulled off a queue, gets processed by a worker, gets spread into four different locations, those get, then do processing, then eventually it turns up in a database, goes onto a website. Now, so that's a lot of steps. So, you know, one of the things that we, we built was a set of custom application sort of specific monitors. And we just, you know, invested a little bit of time, like about a week, mm -hmm. um, wrote a, a little bit of uh, code and a little bit of a framework that was very specific to what we were doing to allow ourselves to do things like, you know, send in like a tracer bullet. Uh, send a message, you know, watch as it goes through the pipe, time how fast it goes through the pipe so you can see, okay, is there, is there going, you know, increasing latency yep. at a certain stage which might say, all right, a queue is filling up. Mm. You know, what, is the, what are those queue counts looking like? So that, again, at a, you know, at a glance, you can say, oh, is something yep. slowing down? Is it, you know, is, is it looking normal? And so, you know, putting, investing a little bit of time into monitoring some of those processes really, really pays dividends, particularly, you know, when, again, that, for that, that whole team responsibility so that someone like our, our marketing lady can look at look at a dashboard without any clue about the yeah. system itself and the internals of it and the you know the mechanics yeah, that are going on under the hood. But just go, over. it yeah. is not green, therefore <laughs> there is a problem. Yeah. And what happens is if something's down, this whole admin site basically gets a red message across the top saying, you know, go and look at this thing. Yeah. Um, and what we've also done is taken that sort of unit testing methodology that we've used on all of our products where if somebody reports an issue, we first, you know, we write a unit test, it fails, we fix the bug, and then that's part of our unit testing suite going forward. So it's a little hard to see, but at the top there's 31 of these monitors that we've, we've built. Jeremy wrote, uh, I think about 18 of them initially just sort of going, hey, here's my best guess at the bits that we want to make sure are working. And then as things have sort of broken over time, you know, write something that monitors that piece. And uh, it's, it's proved to be really useful. Yeah, I mean, using a bit of developer, developer mindset toward, towards uh, solving an operational problem, which has yep. been good. So that's been handy. Yeah. Cool. So the last thing I wanted to, to look at is um, obviously, you know, uh, coming sort of back again towards the development side of the world is this idea of being flexible. Now that we've released the system, you know, it's got uh, terabytes and terabytes worth of data in there. How do we, you know, wrangle some of this data to meet some new requirements? And one um, thing that we did recently, which was, you know, an interesting challenge, uh, I'll just go back to the, to the dashboard is um, with that little graph. Originally we just had a, um, a static view of the graph, you know, errors over time. Yep. Um, but we, you know, got requests from people to say, oh, I want to say, what's this spike over here looking like? Or what's this spike over here? Drill in, filter that down and get a closer look at, look at what's going on. And, you know, drill in like that. And you can see here, you know, we, they wanted things like, oh, I want it obviously to show me what range I've selected and then have all of the tabs update according to what's in that range. So if I move it over here, I'm probably going to get more active errors. And then, of course, naturally you'd want to go, oh, well, seeing as I'm dealing with a, a scoped range, you know, update the counts. You know, seems seems simple enough on the face of it, but as soon as you start dealing with well, lots and lots mind. of data. Yeah, we had we have millions and millions of rows, right, in this thing, in our relational database. And what we'd been doing previously was generating the data for the simple chart that wasn't editable using an offline process. Mm. And the problem was that was getting slower and slower, and then we sort of realized we were, we were using about 90 gigs of database space just to have these pre-computed stats, just for the one chart. Well, for the chart for this, and also for all the error groups. Yeah. So, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, quick, quick, quickly ballooned into a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's just it's surprising how, when you start dealing with bigger problems like this, how um, some of the sort of traditional thinking, I guess, breaks down a little. Um, you know, because I'm very much a, you know, I build ASP.NET over SQL kind of kind of styles, but that, you know, that only takes you so far. And you know, the sort of last big takeaway, I guess, from from our our time building Raygun has been, you know. There's actually an amazing sort of set of tools and little other products out there in the ecosystem that help kind of solve these problems. Other people have solved these problems, right? So we know it can be done. Yeah. But um, you know, can they be done strictly with a relational database and, and, and ASP.NET? Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. So you know, th this particular this particular problem, you know, had had quite a lot, um, you know, w required us to deal with quite a lot of data, and. Um, We'd actually seen a, a, a slide, uh, it was a slide Presentation, yeah. Presentation from, from uh, another company who was doing, doing something similar. And rather than you know, using something like a data warehouse, because um, fundamentally what we need is pre-computed numbers here, right? And, which was kind of what we were doing, but it was just getting a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But they used a different approach. They didn't really use a relational data store. They used um, a key value store to hold that information. Um, and they used um, a, a, a little product called Redis. Um, not sure. Who, who here knows of and or has used Redis? Yep. Cool. All right. 10, 10 15 percent. Yep. Yeah, that's good. We're going to go to the slides. We're starting to run low on time here. We're fine, man. We're fine. <laughs> um, so, just to, to, I guess, set the context, um, you know, a key value store, you know, fairly simple to think of. I mean, I'd think of it like the old HTTP cache. You have a key and you have a value. And I put these in and yep. I can take them out. Um, and, you know, We've, we've seen this go uh, out of process with things like uh, you know, the state server or uh, memcache. Again, you get a key and a value, put it in, yep. take it out. Simple enough. Where Redis differs itself over that is it provides um, data structures and awareness of those data structures to you as developers so that you don't have to kind of implement those as an application specific concern, which seems simple enough on the face of it. You're like, mm, OK. Cool. How am I going to use this? Turns out it kind of gives you a number of different tools that you can use depending on the problem you're trying to solve. You could solve all of these problems with a traditional key value store, but it's much simpler doing it and much faster doing yeah, it. Having those data like structures is, is really quite unique. Um, it's kind of like you know when you're writing your code, and you can choose between a dictionary or a hash or a set or whatever you know. And but all of this is now externalized into its own server. And once like, like Jeremy says, at first it seems a little bit different, a bit weird, and you can't understand how you might use it. But with time, we've found it to be an essential sort of uh, piece of our infrastructure. Yeah, so Redis itself is a simple little beast. I mean, it runs on, on, on Windows and on uh, Unix. And uh, really, what you do is you just uh, fire up a little executable. There you go, there's my Redis server. It's now providing uh, key value store and RAM. I mean, this is good just straight away for, for, for something like caching, because you know, we've now got an out of process. Uh, server that we can deal with for caching, you know, as we, we're scaling out our web servers. So that was that's kind of the first port, port of call that we came to with Raygun as to how we might want to use this. Um, now, using this in .NET, real simple. I mean, um, the server itself, you can tell net into and send commands, and it works that way. But as much as I'd like to work that way, not really that productive. So. Um, you know, as with everything these days, we've got a NuGet package for that. Um, we use uh, service stack .redis, um, for our for our stuff, um, and so you know, you just go new uh, package console install package service stack .redis, um, and then to use this guy called Redis Client Manager, like with Elasticsearch, it kind of lives on its own port six three seven nine. And then we kind of have a scoping pattern here, like a unit of work. Uh, it was manager .get client, And then we can talk to it. Now, as I said, there's different types of data structures that it makes available. So, and, and each of them makes sense in a different mode. So for caching, um, we kind of want to deal with strings. Um, and we've got commands here. And this is uh, Redis.io, which is the website where you can get this and also list all the commands. So you can look them up, very handy. We can get a key. And we can set a key, and we can option, optionally provide an expiry time for that. So that that kind of makes sense. So with our code, we've got set and foo bar. So you know, 
as simple as it gets, really. You know, um, and, and these frameworks, you know, the, these little client libraries, really just give us the ability to to, to operate with these these servers, as simple a, a, as it gets. So let's run that up. Uh, put something in there. If we open up the little command prompt, uh, we can check what keys are in there. Oh, yep, there's foo, get foo, bar. Okay. Don't have to just deal with strings. Um, we can also deal with structured objects as well. Bar, bears. That's good enough. There we go. And you can see it's just been serialized down to JSON for us. So that, that framework deals with the conversion of an object into JSON, hydrates it back into an object. So that that's, you know, provides caching. Mm -hmm. The next thing we looked at using it for was queuing. And for, so for that, we weren't just going to use get and set and mm -hmm. strings. We thought, oh, well, it's a queue. What, 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 what data structure most you know, typically uh, looks like a queue, a stack or a list? Oh, well, yeah, we lists are available in Redis. And so we can push and pop items um, onto, onto, a, onto a list, and, and, and that provides us with a lightweight queuing um, approach. So again, from our code, it's as simple as push item to list. We use queues quite a lot in, uh, with Raygun. It's how we deal with the sort of spiky incoming traffic when somebody's... Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, I mean, the, the, one of the most critical things with the product is we want to deal with as much, much data as quickly as possible. And so to do that, you know, when, when data comes in, we queue it and then that means that we can basically just read the, read the data that comes in, do a quick sanity check, push it onto a queue, and that's almost an instantaneous yeah. operation. Yeah. And we create a queue per app so that, for example, when somebody writes a really buggy Java app, they don't slow down the error processing for other people who are also using the service. Yeah, so if we pop off that, that queue, one, two, three, and that's the end of the queue. Yeah. So again, very simple, lightweight sort of stuff, but it's amazing how powerful this stuff, you know, because it gets straight away, you just, you just get queuing. Yeah really simply um, and, and can just pop it into it. It's one of those products as well that the more we, like when we started using it, we kind of went, ah, oh, that's a bit of a random little thing, we'll, we'll chuck it in there. And then with time, quite often the answer to a lot of our problems has been, we should just use Redis for this. Um, yeah. It does require a little bit of sort of sideways thinking at times, but. And, yeah, and exactly. I mean, it's very surprising for me as a relational guy to, um, to, to look at this. And, and, you know, going back to, to the problem we had with the statistics, is we wanted to pre-compute the statistics, right, so that we could read them out. What we can do with Redis is, all right, we've got these hashes and sets that, that make sense for dealing with time series data, which is what we're dealing with with those stats. And so one of the commands that's available in Redis is this thing h increment by, um, and we give it a key and a value that we want to, to, um, to increment, and then the increment that we want to give it. So every time we process a message, we just tot up another yeah. number. So in this case here, app, X, where X is the ID of a given app that's been monitored, stats, then the time. Yep, so we're, to we're totaling them up hourly. We just, you know, increment, 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 increment. And, and that works surprisingly fast. And, yep. you know, it compared to computing those numbers after the fact. Yep. Who yeah. knew computers could increment numbers fast? That's right. <laughs> to get those back out, we can, we can just use another command, hget, to get those back out. Um, and along the way, you know, when, when we're putting this in, we sort of learned a few little tips um, about how, you know, most effectively to use um, uh, something like Redis, which is, um, you know, you can, you can, you know, create lots and lots of these keys. You, you know, I think you can create um, up to two, two yeah. billion keys or something like that. Oh, I think it's more than that. It's yeah. just mammoth, yeah. So, so you start finding that searching for your needle in the haystack. So if we wanted to find all of the keys that were associated with a given app for our time range, Searching across two billion keys can take a while. So instead, we can use sets to say, OK, well, here's all of the keys that we created relating to this app and kind of cache it that way. So very different thinking to the relational sort of style where we don't want to duplicate data. Here, using document stores like Redis, we do want to duplicate where it makes sense. You know, one, one place to store specific data, another place to, to list all the keys that relate mm -hmm. to that. And then um, we, we lastly kind of said, oh, right, well, now that we've got all of the little buckets that we're storing data into, let's go and fetch the values from them. Yep. What we found is when that becomes a very large number, you've got a very large number of calls. And even though you know, one millisecond or sub-millisecond over a network, when times by a million, actually adds up to real time. So again, you can kind of um, you know, pivot your data a little bit mm -hmm. and, and store um, 
the information sort of pre-computed buckets so that you only have to make one call. So really, really powerful stuff. And it kind of, that's, you know, it, it took us from storing sort of 90 gigs of data down to being able to hold the entire statistic stuff in memory in, in about two gigs now. Yeah, so. 90 to two, to two, which is good. Plus, we were generating it all in real time, and we're making all of that data dance on the web page um, like it's all sitting there in memory on your own machine. And uh, you know, all that came down to a little bit, a little bit of out of the box sort of thinking. Yeah. So very, very surprising. So again, this is what you can use it for. I mean, this is what we're using it for: caching, queuing, series data, and tracking. Just different data types each each time. Just go and have a look for it, um, and yep. you know, and, and try it out yourself. Again. That's the thing we found. You know, there's lots and lots of these little bits of technology that are kind of floating around now um, that people are using to solve these kind of problems where you know, traditionally you might have tried to use your, your big hammer to solve it. Now there's lots of little things yeah. that we and can And there's use. certain things which relational still works for us. Obviously, a list of apps, the users, all of that sort of stuff is all going to stay in a relational database. It's just using the right tool for the job. Mm. This brings us to the end. Um, I really appreciate you guys all coming in today and uh, listening to our talk. We have a bunch of uh, t-shirts here. Unfortunately, they're nearly all XLs. Um, if you want one that's in your size, if it's not XL, we send them out to people typically if they sign up and use Raygun, hint, hint. Um, but come and grab them if, if that size will work for you guys. Um, and otherwise, come and hit us up with questions, either here or outside. Yeah, awesome. We'll be around for the rest of TechEd. Thanks, guys. Thank really you. appreciate it.